Hello, I'm Professor Kitch, and in this example I'll be showing you how to calculate footing settlement using the E-log-P method. For this example, we'll be considering a square footing that's one meter square on the side and carries 120 kilonewton load. The footing's found at half a meter deep on this clay layer. As shown in this example, we have data from a lab test which was performed on a sample taken at point A. And the data are shown here. So for this lab test, we have determined the pre-consolidation stress, the slope of the virgin curve, and the slope of the reload curve. Now the first question we have to ask ourselves is, is this soil over-consolidated or normally consolidated? So to determine this, we will have to calculate the initial effective stress at point A and compare that to the pre-consolidation stress. So at at point A, sigma prime zero is going to be equal to the total stress minus the pore pressure. So that'll be equal to 1.5 meters, the depth of the sample, times the unit weight of the soil, 16, minus 1 meter times the unit weight of water, 9.8. If we do that calculation, we'll find out that the initial effective stress was 14.2 kilopascals. Now we know from the laboratory test that the pre-consolidation stress was 120 kilopascals. Our existing vertical stress is 14.2 kilopascals. Therefore, the soil is over-consolidated. The next question is, how over-consolidated is it? Well, there's two ways to measure over-consolidation. One is the over-consolidation margin, which is the, just the difference between the pre-consolidation stress and the existing vertical stress. In this case, that's 120 minus 14.2, or 105.8 kilopascals. The other way to characterize over-consolidation is the over-consolidation ratio, which is simply the ratio of the pre-consolidation stress to the existing vertical stress. In this case, our over-consolidation ratio would be 8.5. Now we can use either one of these measures to characterize how over-consolidated the soil is. In this problem, we'll use the over-consolidation margin of 105.8 kPa. Now if this footing is resting on a single clay layer, but just because it's the same material does not mean the properties are always uniform with depth. Let's think about this for a minute. If we assume this is the same soil every place, well, that will means that the slope of the virgin curve and the slope of the reload curve and the over-consolidation margin are fixed. But we know that the existing vertical effective stress varies with depth, and therefore the pre-consolidation stress must also vary with depth. So when we say we're on the same soil deposit, we're not saying all the properties are uniform with depth, but some are and some aren't. In addition to the pre-consolidation stress and the initial vertical stress changing with depth, since we have a finite size footing, we know that the change in vertical stress changes with depth also. Just below the footing, we have the initial vertical stress, Q0. In this case, that's going to be 120 kilonewtons divided by 1 meter squared, or 120 kilopascals. But we know from stress distribution that that will decrease as a function of depth, as shown by the yellow line. We can compute how much that decrease in depth is using either the stress bulbs from the Boussinet stress distribution or our simplified equation for the change in vertical stress under the center of a square footing. With either one of these methods, we can calculate the exact change in vertical stress as a function of depth. So we know what's changing with depth at this problem then is both the initial vertical stress, the pre-consolidation stress, and the change in vertical stress. And from that, we can also find out the final vertical stress, and that will vary with depth. So in order to do this calculation, we're going to have to divide this soil up into layers. Now, if we were using a spreadsheet, we could easily divide this into many, many layers. However, we're going to be doing these calculations by hand, and we don't want to calculate 10 or 12 layers. That would be too much work. So with hand calculations, we can get a fairly good estimate of the settlement by dividing the soil just into four layers. But we don't want to divide it into four uniform layers because the change in vertical stress is not a linear function as shown here. With a square footing, this is how the change in vertical stress varies with depth. And here, it's convenient to break the soil into four layers. The first two layers have a thickness of B over 2, and the second two layers have a thickness of just B. 
And if we do this, what we're going to do is we're going to assume that our actual vertical stress is just a step function and equal to the average change in vertical stress at the middle of each layer. Now if we were using a continuous footing, the stress distribution penetrates much deeper into the soil. We could still divide it into four layers, but in this case, the thickness of our layers would be B for the first two and 2B for the second two. And again, we would assume that the change in stress in the middle of each layer is constant and just equal to the vertical stress within the middle of that layer as shown. Now we use these depths shown here because if we go that deep into the soil at the bottom of the layers that we're calculating, the change in vertical stress is going to be about one-tenth of the applied stress. So that's adequate enough for us to calculate using a, just a few number of layers. So now we've divided our soil up into four layers using the algorithm shown on the previous slide. And at the top of this figure is shown equation 331, which is the equation we need to use to calculate the settlement using the E log P method. And if we look carefully at that equation, we'll realize that for each layer, we need to know the initial height, which we've done by dividing up the layers. We'll also need to know the initial vertical stress, the preconsolidation stress, the change in vertical stress. From that we can calculate the final vertical stress. And then we need to know the slope of the reload and the version curve. When we do these calculations, it's important to realize that we must do these calculations at the center of each layer. It's very easy to make a mistake and calculate the change in stresses at the bottom of the layers, and that's not what we want to do. We want to calculate what's going on in the middle of each layer and assume that that's constant for each layer. So let's take a look at layer number one. The center of layer number one is 0 0.75 meters below the ground surface, or 0 0.25 meters below the groundwater table. So first we're going to calculate the existing vertical effective stress. So that's going to be 0 0.75 times 16, the unit weight of the soil, minus 0 0.25 times 9.8, which is the unit weight of water. And that'll give us an existing vertical stress of 9.6 kilopascals. The preconsolidation stress then is just the initial vertical stress plus the preconsolidation margin. We can calculate a preconsolidation margin of 105.8 kPa. So that'll mean that our preconsolidation stress at this layer is 115.4 kPa. And then for layer number two, the center of that is going to be 1.25 meters below the ground surface and 0 0.75 meters below the groundwater table. So again, we'll do the same calculation and we'll find out that the existing effective vertical stress is going to be 12.7 kPa and the preconsolidation stress will be 118.5 kPa. And if I follow the same procedure, I can calculate the existing vertical stress and the preconsolidation stresses for layers 3 and 4. The next step will be to calculate the change in vertical stress for each layer and from that we can calculate the final vertical stress. But first, we're going to fill in the slope of the reload curve and the version curve. So the slope of the reload curve is just going to be C sub R over 1 plus E naught, and for this problem that's going to be 0 0.02. And the slope of the version curve is just going to be C sub C over 1 plus E naught, and for this problem that'll be 0 0.12. And we can go ahead and fill those in for this table because they won't change for this problem because we have only a single clay layer. Now to calculate the change in vertical stress, we're going to use this Boussinesque stress bulb figure. And to do that, we need to go into this figure at a depth relative to the width of the footing. So we're going to calculate Z sub F over B. And for the first layer, the center of that layer was 0.25 meters below the footing. And that's, so Z over B will be 0.25 over 1 or just 0 0.25. We find that place on the stress bulb chart and we note that that's at a contour where I sub sigma is equal to 0 0.9. Or our change in vertical stress at that point will be 0 0.9 times the applied vertical stress of 120, or just 108 kPa. Similarly, the second point is at a depth of 0 0.75 below the footing. In that point, we're going to find that we have a change in vertical stress of 0 0.5 times the initial vertical stress, or that'll be a change in vertical stress of 60 kPa. The third point's at a depth of 1.5 times the width of the footing. We plot that point and then interpolate between the contours. We'll find that the I sub sigma is approximately equal to 0 
which will give us a change in vertical stress of 26.4 kPa. And finally, the third point that we're interested in is at a depth of 3B below the base of the footing, and that's off the end of the chart, but we're going to extrapolate that that gives us a I sub sigma of approximately 0.08, which will give us a change in vertical stress of 9.6 kPa. So now I'm just going to fill in those values of delta sigma in our table and calculate the final vertical effective stress. So for layer 1, the change in stress was 108, and when I add that to 9.6, I'm going to get 117.6 kPa for the final effective vertical stress. And similarly, I can fill in the table for each of the other layers, and then I'll have my final vertical stresses calculated. So now, for layer number 1, we want to calculate the actual settlement from equation 3.31. So first we're going to compare the final vertical stress with the preconsolidation stress. And you'll notice in this layer that the final vertical stress is greater than the preconsolidation stress. So we're going to have to use both terms in equation 331. So in this case, the incremental settlement for layer number one is going to start on the reload curve. And it will go on the reload curve from the initial stress to the preconsolidation stress. So that means we'll start at 9.6 and end up at 115.4. So for this part, we'll take the log of 114.5 divided by 9.6 times 0 0.2, which is the slope of the reload curve. And then we'll have to calculate that portion that's along the virgin curve. And that's going to go from the preconsolidation stress to the final vertical stress. Well, that'll be the log of 117.6 divided by 114.5 times the slope of the virgin curve, which was 0 0.12. We're going to multiply that by the thickness of the layer, which was half a meter. So we do this calculation, we'll find out we have 0 0.0114 meters, or we're going to convert that to millimeters, and that'll give us 11.4 millimeters. Now let's look at layer number two. In layer number two, we'll find that the final vertical stress is actually less than the preconsolidation stress. So in this case, we're loading only on the reload curve, and we only need to use the first term of equation 3.31. In this case, we're going to be loading from the initial stress of 12.7 up to our final stress of 72.7. So the equation will be the log of 72.7 divided by 12.7 times the slope of our reload curve, 0.02. We'll multiply all that again by the thickness of the layer, which is half a meter. We do that calculation and we'll find we get 7.6 millimeters of settlement for that layer. Similarly, I can do the same calculations for the third layer and the fourth layer, and I'll find out that I get 8 millimeters of settlement in the third layer and 3 millimeters of settlement in the fourth layer. So then the total settlement, I'm just going to add those all together, and that'll come out to 30 millimeters of settlement. So that's our total settlement under the center of the footing. Now we have one final calculation to do. As I just pointed out, that settlement is under the center of the footing. And if we calculated the settlement under the edge of the footing, we'd get a smaller settlement because the change in vertical stress would be less. And theoretically, we'd have a bowl-shaped settlement curve like this. But that assumes we have a perfectly flexible footing, and that's not the case here. In this case, we have a rigid footing. And the settlement of the rigid footing has to be uniform across the whole width of the footing. Now, obviously, it can't settle as much as the settlement we calculated in the center of the footing, nor can it settle as little as what we would calculate at the edge of the footing. And based on experience, we know that the settlement of this rigid footing is going to be approximately 85% of that theoretical amount that we calculated at the center. So, to get our final settlement, we'll take 0 0.85 times 30 millimeters and come up with a 26 millimeters. And that'll be the settlement of this rigid footing on this clay layer using the E-log-P method.